Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, good to see everybody back, and uh, again, we always appreciate the folks here in the Tulsa area that come in for this every taping session, and uh, for those of you out in television, if you're ever in the Tulsa area on a particular first Wednesday of the month, usually, uh, call us first, of course, on our 800 number, and we'd be glad to have you come in for an afternoon of taping four programs. Again, we always like to explain to our television audience, because every Every day, I guess, we get new listeners. We're just an informal Bible study. I'm not some high kaflutin scholar. Uh, I'm not going to be throwing a lot of Greek and Hebrew at us. But uh, hopefully we can just sort the Scriptures out and compare Scripture with Scripture and uh, bring folks to the place where we can understand what the Bible really says. You know, a lot of the denominations have been so steeped in tradition that they've forgotten what the book says, and all they can really know is what the denomination says. Well, I'll tell you right up front, when you come before the Lord, whether it's the Bema seat for the believer or the great white throne for an unbeliever, blaming your denomination for leading you astray is not going to cut anything with God, because you have the Word of God. You uh, have it in your own hands, and you study and see what the Word says and uh, not what someone else says. And I don't want to even have someone say, well, this is what Les Feldick says. No, you have to determine what the Word of God says. And uh, this is our whole premise. All right, we're going to pick right up where we left off in uh, the last program, still in Isaiah chapter 42. And remember, in the last three or four words of verse 17, Israel, nationally now, is speaking to their idols, saying that you, these idols, are our gods, plural. And uh, verse 18, that God comes back and He says, Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see. But who is blind but my servant? Well, now, who is the servant? Israel, see? Who is my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he who heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Now, see here again, you've got to be reminded, this is long after the Mosaic law has been given. They've got the Torah. They've got the Ten Commandments. They've got the temple. They've got the priesthood. And yet, in spite of all that, they are going deeper and deeper into idolatry. It's just mind-boggling. All right? Verse 22. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for prey, and none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith, Restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and who gave Israel to the robbers? Who did? The Lord did. The Lord did in chastisement. See, just read on. Did not the Lord, He against whom we have sinned, that is, the nation? For they would not walk in His ways, neither were they obedient unto His law. Therefore, now this, this is plain English, because of their rebellion, because of their idolatry. Therefore He hath poured upon Him, that is, the nation of Israel now, we're referring to it as Jacob or Israel, Therefore He hath poured upon Him the fury of His anger, the strength of battle, and it hath set Him on fire round about. Yet He knew not, and it burned Him, yet He laid it not to heart. Now you've got to stop and think. Come back up with me to Romans. I think maybe this is the easiest way to do this. Back up to Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11. Now Paul here is referring back to Elijah. Now I thought it'd be easier to find Romans than it would 1 Kings. Because 1 Kings is where you have the Old Testament account of Elijah on the Mount Carmel confronting the prophets of Baal. Now remember, Elijah lived 200 years before... Isaiah. So, you see, 
time has been going by ever so slowly. Now, I'll get your time frame again. That 2000, you got the call of Abraham. You got the beginning of the nation of Israel. For 490 years, they first sojourn up and down the land of Canaan. And then the second half of that 490, they're down in Egypt. Then that takes us up to about 1500 B.C. We've lost about 500 years now from Abraham to Moses. They come out of Egypt, and they are now the nation of Israel. All right, another 500 years go by under the judges and so forth until they have King David. King David rules around 1000 B.C., halfway between Abraham and the cross. All right, David and Solomon both rule 40 years each. So from 1000 B.C. until we get Elijah, it's only 100 years. And look how far they've already gone down the pipe in that little while. So all right, look how Paul refers to it then in Romans chapter 11. And uh, let's just jump down to verse 2. Romans 11, verse 2. <clears throat> Where Paul says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. In other words, God knows what they're going to do hundreds of years before they do it. God hasn't cast them away. Know you not what the scripture saith of Elijah and how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, against the nation, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They've digged down, or they've torn down your altars, and I am left alone. I'm the only one left, and they seek my life. Now, verse 4, but Paul reminds us, what was the answer of God unto him, that is, to Elijah? And God tells Elijah, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee, the knee to the image of Baal. Well, what was Baal? An idol, a pagan idol. So already, a hundred years after King David, the nation has already gotten to the place where Isaiah thinks he's the only one left that hasn't fallen to idolatry. But God says, no, I've got a remnant. And that's the way it's always been. God has always kept that small percentage of Israelites or Jews, however you want to refer to them, as remaining true to Jehovah. But for the most part, the nation went down. Now, I know the average Jew probably would tell you that they're going to be in eternity with us because they're the children of Abraham. Well, I beg to differ, because there's only a small remnant of Jews that were ever true believers. All right, now then Paul brings it on up to his own day and time. Back here in about uh, the 58th, 59 A.D., verse 5, even so then at this present time, while Paul is writing, there is also a what? A remnant. See? Always that little remnant. There is a remnant until Paul's day, according to election of grace. All right, now I'll drop down to verse 7. What then? Israel, the nation, has not obtain that which he seeketh for, but the election, the true believer, they obtained it, and the rest were what? Blinded. Blinded. And so now for the last 1900 and some years, that's been the lot of the rank and file Jew. They are blind to the things of God. They, even their Old Testament, they've got it all fouled up. Because God has sovereignly blinded them. But all right, now when you come back then to uh, Isaiah, if you will, you've got to constantly be reminded that even though God chastises the, the nation as a whole, he has always had that remnant that remained true to him. And I think I can safely say this. Because of the remnant then, they would finally come back to the place of blessing. And then they would be blessed nationally for a period of time, and then it wouldn't be long until, again, they would just sink down, for the most part, into a national uh, point of unbelief. All right, now let's just move on into uh, chapter 43 
And uh, again, God is going to constantly remind the nation of who he is. Now, you know, even today, even today, I often have to wonder how many rank-and-file church members, I'm not even going to consider the non-churched world, but even church people, how many of them really know who God is? Do they really have an understanding of his power and his might, his sovereignty, his omniscience, his omnipotence? I'm afraid most don't. God is just sort of a passing thought. Oh, he's up there someplace. Yeah, he's in control. But they really don't know his power and his magic. Well, Israel was no different. They just were blasé about it. And so God comes back and he is showing them who he really is. All right, jump into 40, 43 now, verse 1. But now, now that reminds me. I, I, I said, you know, I'm probably going to put together some programs someday using the but nows in Scripture. But the but nows are really the flip sides. See, here we've seen Israel now steeped in idolatry. But now we're going to see the real God. Not the God of wood and stone, but the God of creation. All right, but now. Thus saith the Lord who created thee. O Jacob, he that formed thee. O Israel, fear not, for I have what? Redeemed thee. Now there comes that whole concept of redemption. That lost people, whether it's Jew or Gentile, no matter what the person's station in life, they're in need of a spiritual redemption. And so this word is just throughout the fabric of the Old Testament that Israel was to be looking for their Redeemer. All right, we'll come to it again when we get to chapter 59, if not today, at a later time. All right, so I have redeemed thee. I have brought you back. Now stop and think again, because after all, to get a knowledge of Scripture, you've got to constantly go back to your building blocks. See, that's what Paul meant in Romans 15 when he says, all these things were written beforehand for our what? Learning. Learning. What does it rest on? What's the foundation of all this? Well, let's go back and just reconstruct. Here we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons. Now that's the beginning of the nation of Israel. Now believe it or not, I've had people who have taught Sunday school for 20 years come up after one of my classes and ask me, where does the Jew come from? Can you imagine that? And I'll be flabbergasted, but it's happened more than once. And even though I'm flabbergasted, I get my cool back and I say, well, no, the nation of Israel came with Abraham at 2000 B.C., pulled off of the mainstream of the Adamic race. All right, now here we've got Jacob and the 12 sons. But one of them, they think, is kind of a braggart. He kind of thinks he's better than the other 11. And who was it? Joseph. And finally, Joseph irritated him to such an extent, what they do? They sold him into slavery. Now, even way back then, who were the slave traders? Ishmaelites. Well, who were Ishmaelites? Arabs. And the world can't get their eyes open. They have always been the master slave traders. Even today, the Muslim world practices slavery more than the rest of the world put together. Why can't people wake up? They are adamant in their slave trading. All right, so Joseph gets sold into slaves, and he ends up down in Egypt. All right, now a lot of people can't comprehend this. When the 11 brothers, now of course little old Benjamin wasn't intricately involved, but he was still, overall, it was still a family deal. When the family sold Joseph down into slavery in Egypt, what happened between them and their God? Well, everything was broken. God lost them. God lost them. Now, when God loses something, like he lost the human race when Adam sinned, 
What does God have to do to get them back? Redeem it. That's where the whole idea of redemption comes in. All right, so now when you're back there in Egypt and God has lost the nation, but they're still, of course, increasing in population, God is going to be watching over them. Don't think he won't. But finally, when the right time comes, he's going to set up a plan of what? Redemption. And that's what the book of Exodus is all about. <coughs> the Exodus out of Egypt is a redemption story. Now then, how is he going to redeem the nation of Israel? The Passover lamb. The blood. And when you heard me teach Exodus, I always made the point. It has never changed. God's plan of redemption takes three things. It takes the blood, it takes an individual, and it takes the power of God. Now, they place the blood on the doorpost on the night of the Passover. Moses was the deliverer. But when they get to the Red Sea and the sea opens up, who delivers the power to do it? God does. All right, now that's the beautiful picture of redemption, no matter how you look at it. Whether it's yours or mine or Israel's, it's the same thing. It took the blood, the blood as the price of redemption. Jesus Christ was the person that God saw fit to be the deliverer. And then at resurrection morning, it was the power of God that delivered it and brought the whole plan of redemption to its completion. So whenever you see this term redeemed, that's what we're talking about. How that God paid the price of redemption to bring whoever it was that he lost back to himself. All right, so for Israel then, God redeemed them when he brought them out of Egypt. And you would have thought that from that point on, those Jews would have been loyal believers to the nth degree, but they weren't. Only a small percentage. All right, now then, let's go. Where was I? Back in uh, chapter 43, and uh, I've redeemed thee. In verse 1, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art, what's the pronoun? Mine. I've bought you. I paid the price for you. You're mine. Now, verse 2, when thou passest through the waters, and I'm sure that's a reference to the Red Sea, I will be with thee. And through the rivers. I think that's a reference to the Jordan at flood time when they came in under Joshua. They shall not overflow thee when thou walkest through the fire. Well, who walked through the fire? The three Hebrews in Daniel. All right. Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? For I am the Lord thy God. I am the Holy One of Israel, thy what? Savior. See how the language all fits? I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee, since thou wast precious in my sight. Now this is God speaking with regard to his beloved chosen people. You know, that makes me stop and think. I read an article the other day, again by one of these scoffers. If God was such a God of love, why did he permit his chosen people to suffer and suffer and suffer? Well, I'll grant that that's a, a good logical question. But the reason he allowed them to suffer is because of their wickedness and their unbelief <coughs> that precipitated it. And so he never stopped loving them, but yet he would bring in the chastisement. All right, let's read on. <clears throat> Verse 5, fear not. Sound familiar? It's exactly what Paul writes in Hebrews. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. All right? Here he says, fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Sound familiar? Well, that's exactly what has happened since 1900. Same thing. The Jews have been coming back from the four corners of the earth back to the homeland providentially. And I think I said it in the last program, if you really stop to analyze it, what a miracle. 
that here they've been scattered into the nations of the world. They're few in number, but yet God is bringing them back against all odds. All right, now he didn't do it just once. He's already done it twice. And now, of course, the next time they're going to be there to stay. All right, reading on. Verse 7, Every one that is called by my name, I have created him for my glory. Now, we're talking about the nation of Israel. We're not talking about the pagan Gentiles. We're not talking about you and I. I've got to start watching my grammar. We're not talking about you and me, about as a preposition. <laughs> Sorry, you English professors. I'm trying to watch it now <laughs> that I use the prepositional pronoun following the preposition. All right. So he's not just talking about you and me. He's talking about Israel. All right. Verse 8. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. A contradiction? No. Physically, they've got ears. Physically, they've got eyes. But spiritually, what are they? Deaf and blind. It's no different today. It's not one bit different today. People have got ears to hear. They've got eyes to see. But will they? Oh, I hear it constantly. I hear it constantly. Once they see this, like I shared with you in the studio before we started today, once they see this, now, this gentleman, I'm not going to put it out publicly, but this gentleman I talked to you about in the studio, I can guarantee you that when he goes back to his own people with these things that he has now seen so clearly, they're going to think he's lost it. They thought, they're going to think he's out of his cage. I've got people here, you already know what I'm talking about. Why? They do not want to see what the Word says. They want to stay in their semi-darkness, rather than see the light. We hear it all the time. All right, reading on. Verse 9, Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Who among the children of Israel has the knowledge that their God has? Not a one. You know, even Job had to find that out, didn't it? Yeah, Job had to find out that, oh, you know, I, I'm careful when I say this, but when you think of Job, I think the guy was proud. I think Job thought he had it made. But when he was confronted with the omnipotent God, what did Job have to realize? He was nothing. He was nothing. And when he got to that realization, what did he have to do? Repent in dust and ashes. All right, now, Israel the same way. See, they were proud of the fact that they were God's chosen people, and yet they didn't take that in consideration when they started following idols. All right, read on. Verse 10. Oh, well, I better finish verse 9. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be ascended. Who among them can declare this and show us former thing? Let them bring forth their what? Witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, it is what? Truth. That's what counts. Truth. And what's truth? The Word of God. Everything else becomes just so much vapor. It just disappears. But the Word of God is truth. All right, now verse 10. You are my witnesses, God says to Israel. They alone had a knowledge of the one true God. You are my witnesses, verse 10 again, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. What is the term again? Servant. And what's the role of a servant? To carry out the bidding of the master. See? You have uh, been my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me, that's faith, remember, and understand that I am he, that is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Sound familiar? How did Peter put it in the book of Acts? There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. How does Paul put it? 
There is no other name. But at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. All of Scripture declares that, old and new. All right, reading on. Verse 12, I have declared and have saved, I have showed when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses. That was Israel's role. That's why God spent so much time with them and delivered them out of Egypt, gave them the priesthood, gave them the tabernacle worship so that they could be a testimony to the pagan world around them. All right? Verse 13, Yea, before the day was, I am He, I am your God, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it or permit it? Verse 14, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer. See, there it is again. The one who has bought you back, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles, the Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel. I am, I'm putting the verb back in, your what? King. You remember what Isaiah said a couple <coughs> programs back? I saw the Lord of glory. I saw the what? You remember? The King. Oh, indeed, he's Israel's King. Always not active yet, but he will be. That's all future. But one day he's going to be Israel's king. And you see that, of course, in Revelation when it says what? At the second coming. And on his thigh is written what? King of kings and Lord of lords. See? He's never accomplished that role before, but it's coming. And Israel is to be a witness of all that. See? All right? Verse 16, and our time is running out. Verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, who maketh the way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, who bringeth forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the palm. In other words, when the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, when they come marching in against Jerusalem, who is bringing it about? The God of glory. The God of glory. Israel's God as a chastisement for their idolatry. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.